As they had grown more famous, however, problems among the Beatles grew bigger. In the beginning, John and Paul wrote nearly all the Beatles songs. George, however, was also a talented songwriter. But only one or two of his songs seemed to make it onto an album. That made him angry. Then in 1967, their manager, Brian Epstein, died, and the band lost the glue that held them together. Epstein had acted as a go-between and peacemaker during fights. John's romance with the artist Yoko Ono created more conflict. John insisted on having her sit in on all recording sessions. He wanted her advice. This made the other Beatles furious. They had always had an agreement that no wives or girlfriends could come to the studio when they were working. All the problems came to a head in April 1970. Paul announced he was released, releasing a solo album. The Beatles were breaking up. It caught fans by surprise and made headlines in newspapers around the world. In later years, all of the Beatles would have successful solo careers. But their breakup meant the, the, the end of an amazing chapter in rock music. Tragedy On December 8, 1980, in New York City, John Lennon was shot to death by a mentally, by a mentally ill fan seeking fame. It happened right in front of the apartment building, where he lived with Yoko Ono and their young son. Lennon was only 40 years old. The following Sunday, a crowd of 225,000 people gathered for 10 minutes of silence in Central Park. In October 1985, a memorial to John Lennon called Strawberry Fields was opened in Central Park. It is a tribute to Lennon and a reference to one of his famous songs. The British Invasion After the Beatles, almost any band from England became overnight sensations in the United States. This was called the British Invasion by the press. The group that became most famous was the Rolling Stones, with Mick Jagger as lead singer. They had longer, scruffier hair than the Beatles and didn't wear matching suits. Although they looked like bad boys, one newspaper article asked, would you let your daughter marry a Rolling Stone? For most parents, the answer was no. Besides the Rolling Stones, other British groups such as the Who and the Kinks had real musical talent and went on to have long successful careers. Others, however, got by on English accents and stale music hall songs like Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter, Herman's Hermits, or do the Freddy, Freddy and the Dreamers. Chapter 4 The Beach Boys A very different band grew up at the same time as the Beatles. Their music came out of Southern California, with its beaches and sunny skies. The band was made up of three brothers, Brian, Dennis, and Carl Wilson, their cousin, Mike Love, and a high school friend, Al Jardine. They called themselves the Beach Boys. The Beach Boys' early songs were about the California teen lifestyle, surfing, driving cool cars, and dating pretty girls. Their first single, Surfing, was a big hit in the Los Angeles area, followed soon after by 409. 
a song name for Chevrolet's high-powered engine. Brian Wilson was the creative force behind the Beach Boys' music and lyrics, but Brian had grown tired of writing bland pop hits. The band's mix of guitars and drums was too simple for his taste. So Brian stopped touring. While the Beach Boys were on the road, he had time to try out new things in music. When he heard Rubber Soul, Brian understood that the Beatles were changing the sound and structure of rock music. Rock changed from music that was great to dance to into music that you simply listen to. Brian wanted to compete with the Beatles' latest albums. Soon he began experimenting with non-pop instruments like violins and cellos, piccolos and even xylophones, sleigh bells, empty coke cans, and barking dogs. The result of all the time Brian spent playing around with music was an album called Pet Sounds. The other Beach Boys sang vocals but did not play any instruments on it. Instead, Brian recorded it with a crew of top studio musicians. All the songs on Pet Sounds are linked with a common theme, loneliness. And although the album had disappointing sales when it came out, it did produce several big single hits, including Caroline No, God Only Knows, and Wouldn't It Be Nice. Even before Pet Sounds was in stores, the Beatles heard it. The musician, who replaced Brian on tour, had come to London. He brought a copy of Pet Sounds for John and Paul to listen to. As soon as the record was finished playing, they asked to hear it again. They had never experienced anything like it. They wanted to make their next album even better than Brian Wilson's masterpiece. In June of 1967, the Beatles released Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Which album was better? That depends on whom you ask. In 2003, Rolling Stone magazine put together a list of the 500 greatest rock albums. Pet Sounds came in at number two, and Sgt. Pepper was number one. As for Brian, he began work on a new album called Smile, but he was struggling with drug problems and mental illness. He did not put his life back together until 1995. After that, he finally finished Smile. In the meantime, the Beach Boys continued without him for several years, playing the old surfing and hot rod songs. The Beach Boys left their mark on rock and roll. But by the late 1960s, the glory days were over. Chapter 5 Acid Rock The late 1960s was where troubling time in the United States. Many young people no longer believe in the way of life that their parents led. Calling themselves hippies, they rejected war and violence and greed. Some tried to expand their minds by using illegal drugs show, uh, 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 such as marijuana or LSD which was known as acid. Rock and roll reflected the times. Psychedelic or acid rock often tried to copy the mind-expanding effects of LSD. In the United States, the center of acid rock was Hyde Ashbury, a run-down neighborhood in San Francisco, California. Many psychedelic bands lived together there. The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Quicksilver Messenger Service, and Big Brother and the Holding Company. On many of these groups' albums, there were long instrumentals, music without words, that were called jams. 
in concert, one song might last 20 minutes, like Dark Star by the Grateful Dead. Heavily distorted guitars that use wah-wah pedals and fuzz boxes were also part of the music. Many psychedelic bands are used organs, harpsichords, and or early synthesizers to create a floating, pulsating undercurrent that made the music feel otherworld otherworldly. Otherworldly. Very often it at concerts. Light shows would be projected onto a screen above and behind the band. Swirling shapes changed color and size as the music played. The lyrics to some acid rock songs seem to make no sense. Here are words to a song by a group called the 13th Floor Elevators. Bedouin tribes as ascending from, from the egg into the flower, alpha information sending. What does that mean? Your guess is as good as anybody's. Psychedelic influences appeared in the art on posters and album covers. Super bright colors and swirling lettering forced viewers to look long and hard at posters for concerts at the Fillmore West in San Francisco and other places. The first major hippie music festival, Monterey Pop, was held in 1967 in Monterey, California. 30,000 fans filled the fairgrounds. A new singer, Janis Joplin, with the band Big Brother and the Holding Company, stunned the crowd with a raw, piercing song called Ball and Chain. The Who appeared. They were famous in England, but almost unknown in the United States. Their show-stopping finale was My Generation, with its memorable line, I hope I die before I get old. As the song ended, guitarist Pete Townsend smashed his Stratocaster guitar and amplifier. Smoke bombs exploded, and Keith Moon kicked his drum set to pieces. A trio called the Jimi Hendrix Exper Experience was next. Hendrix had not wanted to follow The Who because he knew they stole every show. However, he had lost a coin toss with Pete Townsend and had to go on after The Who. Jimi Hendrix was black and from the United States. But he was a hard rocker and not in any way like the soul musicians of the early 60s. Jimmy was left-handed, but played his right-handed Fender Stratocaster reversed and upside down. His trio, the Jimi Hendrix Experience, Jimi Hendrix Experience, started out in England. Hendrix was a star over there before he became one in his home country. At Monterey Pop, Jimi Hendrix proved that he owned any stage he performed on. He used distortion and feedback on his guitar as if they were separate uh, as if they were separate instruments. Jimmy finished the set with the song Wild Thing. He played his Stratocaster with his teeth and also behind his head. Other sounds of the 60s. At pretty much the same time as acid rock flourished softer Sweeter music also became popular. It was called folk rock. It took old folk songs that, that then added electric guitar, some tambourines, and harmonica to make a new sound. Listen to the Birds cover of Bob Dylan's Mr. Tambourine Man and My Back Pages. Country rock used some country music instruments like the pedal steel guitar, mandolin, and fiddle. Graham Parsons, who was briefly in the birds, is often credited with getting 
country rock started with a band called the Flying Burrito Brothers. He was an exceptionally gifted songwriter whose career was cut short by a drug overdose in 1973. He was 26. At the end, Hendrix knelt on the stage and set his guitar on fire. He then smashed it to pieces and threw them into the audience. Jimi Hendrix was also the last act at the most famous rock festival ever held. It took place in August 1969 in Bethel, New York. It was called Woodstock and was advertised as three days of peace and music. It drew 400,000 young people from all around the United States to see 32 music acts, including Santana, Credence, Clearwater Revival, Jefferson Airplane, and the Grateful Dead. There were heavy rains that turned the large area in front of the stage into a sea of mud. Fans got drenched but stayed for the music and did their best to have a wonderful time. At 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, Hendrix and his band took the stage. By then, the crowd had shrunk to, to between 30 and 40,000 people. Near the end of his set, Hendrix played a feedback drenched version of the Star Spangled Banner. He recreated the, the roar of cannons and the bursting of shells. Jimmy wore a red bandana and a white fringe jacket and with blue beads. The colors of the American flag. In years to come, there would be other larger music festivals in many places around the world, but Woodstock was a landmark. Guitar Gods Jimi Hendrix is probably the guitar player that everyone else wants to be, but there are other greats who also are referred to as guitar gods. Chuck Berry was one of the pioneers of rock guitar. John Lennon once said, if you tried to give rock and roll another name, you might call it Chuck Berry. Prince was such an exciting performer with such a distinctive look that sometimes his guitar playing could be overlooked. Watching him play can make your jaw drop. Eric Clapton's playing seems effortless even when he is tearing off a super fast string of notes. The Allman Brothers Band had not one but two outstanding guitar players. Dickie Betts and Duane Allman could play along, could play long, complicated solos, even in unison. Jeff Beck had been in many bands and can play any style of music, the blues, jazz, jazz fusion, rockabilly, as well as solid rock. Chapter 6 Sounds of the 70s The year 1970 was very sad for fans of rock music. Besides the April breakup of the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix died in September after combining alcohol with drugs. In October, Janis Joplin, who was recording with a new band, also died of a heroin overdose. Nine months after that, Jim Morrison, lead singer of the acid rock group The Doors, died of heart failure. It had been brought on by alcohol and heroin. All three were only 27 years old. Was this the end of rock and roll? Hardly. There were new sounds to be heard. Disco music became hot in the 1970s. It was smooth music 
with a steady repeating beat. People dance to disco all night long at clubs called disco six. Then came punk rock. Punk was a loud, angry rebellion against the repetitive beats of disco and the long, complicated, and overproduced hippie songs of the late 60s. Many punk rockers wanted to get back to a simple, hard-pounding sound that was more like the, the, like, like the rock and roll of early days. The songs often had three chord progressions and simple lyrics and they were usually short, often not even three minutes long. Punk rock took off in the United States in part of because of CBGB, a New York City rock and roll club that opened in 1973. CBGB was a place for punk bands to play their music live to an audience of rock fans. One of the most popular American punk bands, The Ramones, played CBGB for the first time in 1974. Although none of them were related, these four friends from Queens, New York adopted Ramon as their common last name. They got the idea from Paul McCartney, a member of the Beatles. Paul used the name Paul Ramon when he checked into hotels so people wouldn't know he was staying there. Joey Ramon was the lead singer. Johnny Ramone played guitar, Dee Dee Ramone played bass guitar and wrote many of the songs. Tommy Ramone was the drummer until 1977. He was followed by Marky Ramone. Some of the Ramones' most well-known songs were Blitzkrieg Bop, I Want to Be Sedated, and Rock and Roll High School. Besides the sound of their music, the Ramones had the punk look, skinny ripped jeans ratty t-shirts, beat-up sneakers, and black leather motorcycle jackets. In their early days, Ramon's concerts were often messy. One club owner said that a 40-minute set was 20 minutes of music and 20 minutes of the band arguing with one another. In time, however, they got their act together and toured for over 20 years, playing more than 2,000 concerts. Although they never made, they never had a major hit record, the Ramones had a devoted following of fans. They also made a huge impact on other bands of the era, as well as on a younger generation of rock musicians like Green Day, Black Flag, and Red Hot Chili Peppers. Blondie was another hard-driving 70s New York City punk band that got its start playing at CBGB. The lead singer Debbie Harry had a killer rock voice and a tough girl attitude that was perfect for songs like Ripper the Shreds and One Way or Another. Blondie continues to record new music and tour after more than 40 years. Blondie took punk rock and mixed it with other styles of music, like pop. This created something new called New Wave. The Talking Heads were another New Wave band. They played their first show at CBGB as the Ramones' opening act. Most songs were written by the Talking Heads leader David Byrne. Songs such as Psycho Killer, Once in a Lifetime, and Burning Down the House that are still often heard on rock radio stations today. During the 1970s, glam rock, also known as glitter rock, was born in England, then found fans in the United States. Glam bands often wore fancy costumes, stage makeup, and high platform boots. Glam rock's biggest star was David Bowie. In 1972, Bowie released his concept album, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and His Spiders from Mars. A concept album is a collection of songs that are all about one theme. Sometimes concept albums tell stories. The songs on Ziggy Stardust tell a story about an alien named Ziggy who comes to Earth and becomes a rock star. Bowie's band 
wore high shiny black boots and multicolored jumpsuits. David as Ziggy dyed his hair bright red, wore pale white makeup, and dressed in silver suits. The first single from the album Starman became a hit. Bowie went on to act in movies like Labyrinth and The Man Who Fell to Earth. He also painted and recorded many more albums. Let's Dance came out in 1984. It, it included three giant hits. The album's title song, China Girl, and Modern Love. Bowie was a rock giant and a major influence on many different types of rock, including punk and grunge. His final album, Black Star, was released two days before his death in 2016. Chapter 7 A Kid from New Jersey David Bowie was British through and through. However, in the 1970s, a homegrown born in the USA superstar was coming into his own as an incredible singer and songwriter. He was a kid from New Jersey. His name was Bruce Springsteen. In high school, he played in several local bands and was nicknamed The Boss because he was a natural leader. Over time, Bruce met the musicians who would become famous as the E Street Band. The group got its name because it had rehearsed at a house on E Street in Belmar, New Jersey. They were the backup band for Bruce Springsteen for many years. Bruce and the band played many shows at a club called the Stone Pony in Asbury Park in New Jersey. Bruce's manager got him to audition at the office of John Hammond of Columbia Records. Hammond loved what he heard, but wanted to see Bruce perform that night in front of a live audience at a New York City club called The Gaslight. Hammond was impressed with Bruce's show. He signed him up with Columbia Records. Springsteen's, Springsteen's first two albums didn't sell well, but in 1975, Born to Run made Bruce a star. In time, the album sold 6 million copies, and its title track became a hit single. Bruce Springsteen's songs with their thumping beat show his New Jersey roots. He writes about the struggles that ordinary working class people face trying to find love, success, and happiness. His songs are almost like stories, and many have strong messages. For example, his hit, Born in the USA, was about the hard times facing U.S. soldiers coming home from the far-off war in Vietnam. He also wrote about American factories closing down and putting people out of work. When he performed, Bruce didn't wear fancy stage costumes or look like a hippie. He preferred well-worn blue jeans, t-shirts, and a leather jacket. Almost every show was a high-energy three-hour performance that left Bruce, the band, and the audience elated and exhausted at the same time. After 40 years, Bruce Springsteen is still recording great albums and touring. Long after Elvis, long after the Beatles, long after Janis Joplin, there is still Bruce Springsteen.